truly glorious day. So very nice that you uh, log in and join us, uh, despite it being um, one of the very finest days of the year. Okay, uh, I'm going to say, first of all, a little bit about disruption, your exercise. Uh, you're about to get this today. Um, the only reason why you don't already have it is um, I'm still tweaking the group numbers um, and assigning to the dates, and I want to lock them into this document. Um, uh, I uh, obviously posted on announcements, and you've all seen it because you've got the login details too, uh, that I wanted everyone to let me know absolutely if there was a risk, and even just a risk is okay. It doesn't have to be certain, but a risk that you can't participate in the 10th, the 16th, or the, or the 17th of December, when we'll have our um, online group presentations. That's that's online. They're not they're not in person here in the campus. So, uh, a couple of people misunderstood that. So they're they're online, um, and you use the uh, screen share function, desk share in Zoom and whatnot. Um, and uh, I'll give you some hints about how groups should uh, certainly do a do a practice run in advance on Zoom before they on the day have an audience of eighty odd. Um, and uh, have, it, have it go pear-shaped. So anyway, I asked explicitly for people to write to me an email and tell me if you couldn't make, uh, possibly couldn't make it. Uh, I had two people who did that just last night, quite late, as I was kind of forming up the groups. Um, so I'm giving you one last chance and really last, last, last chance. Um, tell me by, uh, tell me by, let me think I've got, of the class this afternoon and I've got a meeting. Um, tell me by four o'clock this afternoon um, if there's an issue with you participating in the class potentially on the 10th, the 16th or the 17th of December. Um, let me write that in chat. Okay, so right, I've, this will be the fourth request on this, okay. Um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, um, let me see. See, Masakazu has sent me a private message and I've accidentally replied to that. So, um, Zoom obviously likes to make the default the private message so that people don't say, Oh my God, can you do you believe what he's wearing today? You know, on Zoom, um, and you send it to everyone by mistake. Okay, so there's the message to everybody. And let me go up and find actually, right? Okay. Good, 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 good. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Right. So, absolutely, I need to know that. I will take a. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a patient person until I'm not. Um, I'll take a very dim view of anyone who, on the last minute, springs it on me, simply saying, "Oh, I can't be in there here for this particular day because I've got some internship on the 16th." Um, actually, an enormous number of people have told me that they have. A potential internship on the 16th or the 17th. They seem to, uh, everyone seems to be applying for the same internship. Um, well, the takeaway implications here is if you don't be surprised if you don't get it, because I can tell you there's a lot of competition from uh, uh, SILs, uh, and maybe there's a couple of them that people are uh, competing for. Okay, so right now to our um, warm up task. Okay, and I'm going to write the, uh, the the task here in chat okay directly um from my handwritten notes here okay okay so uh this is just a fundamental issue in governance you know what is our starting assumption so in short you know what is our um model of human nature in short okay um so Really what we want to know is what makes a person good? Okay, under what conditions uh, will people be good? In the work context, uh, clearly here we're thinking primarily about people responsible in uh, an organization as an employee, as a, as a manager, for example, or as the owner of a business. Uh, it can be the employee of a, of a not-for-profit and, and that's a recurrent theme here that um, we're talking about the corporation, but also the not-for-profit corporation. So what makes a person good? Uh, what makes them um, good in society at large, okay? Um, we've got the vast majority of uh, people 
wearing masks on public transport, for example. So what's the, uh, what are the drivers of that behavior, for example? By the way, I have, I have a little categorization of the three kinds of people I'm seeing. Um, no, four categories of people not wearing masks. One, yoporai, drunks, okay? I take the last train home most nights. And so um, that seems to be general, um, general kind of drunken stupidity. Um, and it's been told to me that if you're a bit drunk and you're wearing a mask, the smell of your own alcohol on your breath makes you sick. Um, okay. Uh, don't drink in the first place, if that's the case. Um, but anyway, yoporai, you can kind of get it, okay? If we think in terms of corona, imagine, imagine you already had corona um, and you've gotten over it and you've had the test of the antibody, so you're not afraid of getting it again. Um, now I know people say maybe you can catch it again, but there's only been a couple of cases of that. So for the most part, you do get antibodies, which is going to protect you for probably at least six months. Um, so the chance of you getting corona again is pretty low and you know you're no longer infectious. Would you wear a mask or not? Would it be an act of solidarity, you know, to, um, would you be concerned about what other people say? So this is one way you can start to think about what makes you well behaved, okay? Um, even if it doesn't actually have any meaning, is it a symbolic act of, of solidarity? So that's an open question. Um, so, but there's a lot of things we think about. Um, how often is it about a fear of getting in trouble? Many countries have uh, effectively made it illegal to be in public now without a mask. So they quite explicitly, um, want to make you uh, afraid of getting a fine in the state of Victoria, um, city of Melbourne in Australia, uh, going out in public without a mask will cost you $200, okay? So that's the idea there that they um, had to um, um, get you in trouble. And uh, when they put a price on it, it's one incentive, but we think of good incentives and bad incentives, okay? So fear of punishment, okay? Um, is it just learned morals and not just, that's one of the hardest thing to do, learned morals and ethics, um, parents, societies, churches, and um, all religious organizations spend lots of time trying to inculcate morals and ethics in people. Um, is it fear of reputation of your family and your friends, what they may think of you? Is it the wider, wider world of work and society? Um, it's quite possible that uh, some people don't care what their family think of, but that but care very much uh, about the social media pro social media profile uh, if they're trying to uh, make a career as a, a vlogger or something okay um, alternatively you may not care what uh, strangers think of you but you may care very much about what your own in-group uh, thinks of you and we think of some societies in these terms so is it fear of punishment in the afterlife all all religions have this very strong sense that um uh, uh, our entity that is ourselves, our spirit um, doesn't die with us, that, it, that uh, there, there is something in the afterlife. And uh, so do you fear punishment there? Maybe going to hell? Um, maybe if you're a Buddhist, for example, being reincarnated as something unpleasant, okay? So this all comes down to our model of human nature. And it has a very big impact on how we think about governance. Uh, how we would encourage people to engage in socially desirable behaviors and in maybe responsible behaviors uh, towards a, a, a corporation, its assets, its clients, and whatnot. The book leads with the conversation of the American corporation and why I'm talking about America first before I'm talking about the British case is because fundamentally it is where America, America is where the modern corporation, um, as we understand it, evolves. Excuse me. And indeed the legal foundation for it as well. So we've seen obviously the historical context, uh, a couple thousand years uh, of the idea of the firm in some sense and very significant European examples and several striking periods in particularly French and British history where there were huge economic booms earlier on, the South Sea bubble, for example, and Mississippi Company in the French case with John Law, where lots of attention was given to the potential of the company. But the uh, bubble burst on both of those cases and made people very nervous uh, about uh, the corporate form. 
remember both of those booms and busts and scandals around the use of the corporation in France and in Britain were tied to the economic potential of the Americas. And we see significantly the rise of the American corporation in the, uh, the 19th century, a lot of it driven by capital coming across from London. So America was the great frontier where European capital flowed to. And so this was developing opportunities in America and in the process, uh, developing the very nation, the understanding of the, the, um, the corporation. So uh, first of all, the 19th century, but really from the beginning of the 18th century, but of course, strikingly in the 19th century and into 20th century, we can think of the settlement of the new world. Of course, it goes on for longer than that, but, but the mass migrations and particularly the mass movement of capital um, is very much from a uh, late 18th century and particularly a 19th and into 20th century phenomena. And this settler capitalism's term I'm using more broadly because, um, and you're gonna see exactly the same slide again, leading into a broader conversation about settler capitalism. So when I talk about the cases of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, to some degree, South Africa, um, and even Israel, we uh, can see as an extension of this. So of course the original colonial power has a very significant impact on how each of these settler capitalisms evolve. And very strikingly in the Canadian and uh, the United States context, uh, we see uh, the English legal tradition and there are certain competitive advantages there. So former British colonies, um, they started on a foundational sin, where it's very much true in my country as well, uh, Australia, the dispossession of native inhabitants and so an ongoing set of issues about reconciliation with the, uh, the First Nations. And um, that, that's, that's an unfinished um, political and cultural project in, any, in each of these countries. So although there is this foundational sin, strikingly as a collection of, of economies and societies, they become some of the most economically and culturally vibrant, open, cosmopolitan and prosperous societies around. Now, it's easy for me to say that as an Australian, but the uh, statistic, well, we'll look at a lot of statistics and we've already looked at some statistics, um, but things like percentage of foreign born, um, openness to migration, a whole range of things, we see this. Now, you may shake your head and think, but hang on, hang on, Donald Trump, and, he, and he's got 40 something percent of the vote. Um, there's, a, there's a lot behind that. There are always isolationist uh, tendencies in the settler societies because, um, in the early days of them, there was a, there was a high level of economic vulnerability um, and indeed the individual um, vulnerability as well too. The whole genre of the, of the Western, for example, um, and the early tales of the, you know, the, ma the massacre of settlers um, in uh, conflicts with uh, um, you know, first Americans, for example. So you know, native um, Indian Americans. So we, uh, we know this, um, this history. Uh, the phenomena of the Republican support being so strong, even clearly with the profound personality flaws of Donald Trump, um, a lot of it can be reduced to a deep longstanding identity politics. There's just a lot of Republicans who can never bring themselves to vote Democrat um, and the other way around. So there's a very strong tribal element, um, very significantly so. There's an there's a identity and cultural wars kind of element. Um, but also we shouldn't underestimate the sheer extent to which um, economic, a sense of personal economic vulnerability uh, helped Donald Trump. Uh, the Republicans generally score higher in terms of trust in relation to running the economy. Now, as we uh, advance our discussion of the next few weeks, we'll see that the, uh, the Republicans have a certain model of capitalism and arguably a less inclusive model of capitalism. Um, but a lot of people do take very seriously some of the foundational ideas of American capitalism and believe that the Republicans are better protectors of a free market system and are less likely to engage in what is always disparagingly referred to by Republican politicians as tax and spend policies, okay? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of other issues bundled up in that in terms of uh, different demographics, you know, white, uh, 
uh, non-university educated males, for example, were more, more likely to have supported Donald Trump. And in, in the past, they may have supported, some of them may have supported uh, the Democrats. Joe Biden's managed to bring some of them back. Uh, but we will, we'll talk about some of those issues when we get into broader discussions of the politics of equality and inequality and whatnot. In terms of other settler capitalisms, um, we, we can't just talk about the Anglo-American world. Huge number, of course, of former um, Spanish, Portuguese and um, French colonies as well. Uh, this colonial legacy is different in each place. There are different forms of colonial models. Um, what's very striking in the early days of America um, is that uh, corporations themselves played a significant role in uh, founding settlements. And um, now, I, as it, uh, no, it didn't, I, I actually took the screenshot on my phone and it hasn't actually synced across yet to my computer. I was going to show it to you. Um, one of the things up in, in, in Rhode Island, uh, there was when people went to vote for the presidency and of course the state state house and for the senate and house of representatives and whatnot there was also a referendum there that passed and it the referendum was because the rhode island was the uh, the name of it was excuse me one moment it's the uh, pro providence that's right so rhode island and providence plantations Literally, um, officially the, in the state name was Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. Now the plantation was actually, uh, it, ha it has an image of being associated with them, um, with slaves, um, but broadly, more broadly a plantation was actually, you know, a major agricultural kind of project. So Rhode Island the settlements, they were actually started by a corporation. And we see in, in several, several cases in America, uh, the corporation itself becomes the governing body, which actually became the state. So they only uh, just earlier this year unofficially stopped um, putting plantation in the title of the state on official documents. And now the referendum has passed to remove it. So this is one of our one of our themes. We've already seen in the text, there was a question on the last quiz and it comes up in, in several contexts, um, including in, uh, the, in the case of the Netherlands, for example, um, and in Venice, how a corporate entity evolves into a civic political entity and in the US case actually becomes a state. Well, anyway, so a few fundamentals about America, and I'm, just to tell you where we're going time-wise, I'll, uh, I'll use our full official time. I'll run up to 10 past, but stop very neatly there, okay? And I'll pick up on a little bit more of this next week. Oh, and uh, my apologies, there's a whole bunch of videos to go up, which are still being edited, and uh, also back videos. So bear with me. I want to get all that sorted over the next two days. There's been a, a lot going on. Anyway, scale of America. Um, if any of you looked at the uh, election coverage and if you want to look at the New York Times, you'll see, of course, um, America is big. If anyone's done a road trip in America, you will know this. Uh, the old Route 66 driving from uh, one coast to the other is uh, quite a journey. I've been along Route 66, but in little bits of it. Um, and the sheer scale of the country um, is enormous. Okay, so we've had a, virtual his, a virtuous historical cycle of economic growth, um, which supports public and private institutions and immigration from the old worlds. So as the uh, economic prospects are good, more and more people come. And as you have more um, migrants, uh, you also get more investment coming. So these are a, it's a win-win, a virtuous cycle of capital flows and human flows into these investment destinations. That only works if the basic governance is good, okay? The capital doesn't keep, keep coming if the governance is not there. If you are investing and the place is very poorly run and you make no return, or even if there is an economic return and you're ripped off. So it's a combination of governance and optimism. Um, sorry, my phone keeps going off. My sister's ringing me from Australia. Um, I'll talk to her later. Okay, so um, we have seen repeatedly, of course, uh, discussions in America about the extent of uh, poverty. 
and uh, poverty was very acute both in rural areas at certain times, and we'll look a little bit at the context of that, um, but also strikingly very significant poverty in uh, the main gateways into America. A lot of people arrived in America with very little, um, pursuing the American dream, and at one point, for example, the Lower East Side um, in the tenements there, and you can go to a tenements museum um, in the Lower East Side if you're in New York, had the highest population density in the world. And so parts of New York were kind of a clearinghouse for successive waves of migrants in uh, different periods. Now, the, the Lower East Side now is super, it's complete hipsterville these days um, and a hugely interesting kind of dynamic area. So we have, we have seen significant periods of depression in the United States. And uh, this is a recurrent theme in all of these settler societies because effectively these are frontiers that are dependent on European capital and in terms of exports of say agricultural products, also dependent on European demand. So whenever the flow of capital or the demand for goods was disrupted by, for example, wars or an economic crisis or something in, uh, say, in the UK, there were even more profound impacts out in the frontier. So unemployment rates, um, poverty uh, could be actually rather worse in the distant frontier than in the sources of the um, economic shock in the first place back in Europe. So certain periods, the 1840s, um, we see 1873, the early 1890s, which was a global phenomena, um, very much it's Australia, Australia as well too, the early 1930s, they hit the peripheral new world economies harder than the central old world economies. This is a very important point. Um, it helps to explain uh, a really deep paradox about uh, places like the United States, my own country, Australia, um, the flip-flopping between optimism and vulnerability, that there is a widespread optimism that the future is good for the nation, but short-term setbacks, okay? And so a real flip-flop between openness to migration and a fear that, whoa, 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 we can't take any more for the moment because you know, the economy is in a very bad way. And so we see this in terms of political dynamics constantly. Um, my country, Australia, the borders are closed now. I can't get back. Uh, we have a quota of 5,000 Australians a week to return, which means that a typical plane flying to Australia um, only has about 30 people on it now. Um, if I have to go back and I was worried my sister calls, my mum's in hospital. Um, if I had to get back to Australia quickly now, I would have two weeks compulsory um, quarantine at $3,000 at my own expense. And when I check the cost of plane tickets back to Australia, they're currently um because the airlines are only selling um, business class at full price because they can only put 30 to 40 passengers on a plane. This is a country that has one of the highest um, rates of migration um, in terms of percentage of the population in the world. And yet they close their borders because of the sudden panic about the uh, pandemic. Um, we saw Donald Trump did a similar kind of thing um, in relation to Corona and then many other countries kind of copied it. So the seeming paradox can be understood about simply because of 150, 200 years of economic history, which shows that there's enormous opportunity, but there's also vulnerability. Uh, I'll say in the Australian context, some of you will have heard about the white Australia policy, Hakugo Shugi, long gone, of course, now Australia one of the culturally most diverse, but that also spoke to that historical vulnerability. So settler capitalisms have this ideational tension between their origins in openness and their vulnerability to external shocks. Exogenous means outside the system. Endogenous is inside the system. It's an academic term, but uh, it's a very important term. What we see in America, and this is what makes America different from New Zealand, from, from, Fuji, from Fiji, from Australia, from Israel, from South Africa, uh, for example, is the sheer scale of America. Um, that when America's population gets up over 250 million, for example, we're heading towards 300 million, um, America can be very significantly self-reliant because of the sheer scale of the place. Um, Scandinavia, 
uh, or other smaller settler societies have nothing like this kind of scale, okay? Now, uh, one of the really striking features about America is the model of profound affluence that comes about when America kind of perfects organizationally large scale finance and organization through the company to take advantage of its own geography, okay? Uh, this is most encapsulated in the period of what's called the Gilded Age. It was actually critical reference, an ironic reference um, from the very famous writer Mark Twain, 1873. Of course, his satire and irony has been forgotten. Um, but he, he talked uh, really about the fabulous wealth that was being made through things like the railways and the iron steel industry that was associated and steam and um, a whole range, range of things, okay? Um, which was involving the, uh, the mass settlement of America, um, the mass building of infrastructure to support that in a virtuous cycle, and the huge wealth that was made and then manifested in places like um, New York and whatnot. When he talked about the Gilded Age, he said that it was, it was like Kimpaku, okay? That there was a thin veneer of gold surfacing and underneath the, uh, the reality was much more pedestrian, much more average, um, unpleasant in some ways. Um, but the focus was very much on the enormous personal fortunes that were made through the expansion of the railways in particular. And we see 1869 is when the east and west coasts of the, of the United States are linked, when for the first time um, America as, you know, the contiguous America, which controls a continent from one coast to the other, becomes in practice a reality. And... Um, the typical image of, you know, the uh, the cowboy movie, you know, the the lone cowboy riding out there, maybe chasing the train, you know, um, to try and rescue the girl who's been tied onto the railway tracks, you know, from the oncoming train with a Hollywood invention. If you want to kill someone, you just kill them. You don't go to the trouble of tying them onto a onto a train tracks, especially when in those days, maybe one train a day would pass along the tracks. <laughs> it's a pretty inefficient way to kill somebody, okay? But it made, made, uh, made for a good Western. But the, uh, the genre of the Western speaks to this particular period. Uh, and to some degree, it was actually a, a reimagining of a much more pedestrian process of actually settling and, and unifying the nation. Uh, we see powerful industrialists and then the rise of unions in response. But what becomes a really interesting question is in many other industrial societies, the unions become particularly strong, but this is much less so in America. So real wealth in America comes about through um, the phenomena of the scalability of businesses. You suddenly realize that if you build a railway and manage to work, work the costs out so that it's efficient running a railway over 40 kilometers or 40 miles, why not 400 miles? Why not 4,000 miles? Okay, so this, this scalability phenomena, you know, if you've got one McDonald's making a profit, um, why not have five? Why not have 10? Why not have 5,000 McDonald's? Okay. And so this becomes the takeaway lesson in American business that whenever you're building a business, you have a view to the scalability of the business. This is how um, Facebook starts off uh, with a couple of guys uh, creating a platform for some Harvard students to connect. Originally, they, because uh, they were snobs, Oh, and we only want Harvard people in it. Then they thought, well, we'll open it up. Maybe some other people will come. And then it took off amongst college students. And then, and then um, lo and behold, in, in about a decade, they've got a billion users. And then um, nobody seems to notice when they went from a billion to two billion users. Um, just this scalability of the enterprise and the enormous wealth um, that is generated. So scalability is the basic design principle. Okay. Um, I'll stop here looking at our time. Uh, you've got very good video materials uh, that are already on the website. And uh, so when you're looking at the video on demand stuff for this week, there's just a link across to the website. You can go and look at those videos there. Of course, uh, they're part of larger playlists. playlists. Um, Daniel Jurgen, for example, who figured in one of our earlier videos, very famously the book um, that he writes about the, uh, the history of oil and the oil industry. Um, Texas was colored red there. There was a hope that the Democrats would flip it, but um, that spirit of kind of wild west entrepreneurship is um, that the Republicans have given so much expression to is so indelibly associated with uh, Texas, obviously. Um, so it's no surprise that uh, it, it did stay red, although it's becoming uh, diversified. 
So I think uh, so many of us have grown up with the uh, cultural representations of this era in America. It's not difficult for us to imagine, but do engage with those documentaries. Um, I'll continue this discussion next week, um, and I'll talk about the parallels with um, the British case and some European cases and whatnot. But as you'll see, I've already made all, put all the lecture slides up for next week, which is far more than I can possibly cover. I don't intend to talk to the bulk of them. I'm going to create more video on demand content. Uh, it'll be to me, to, to some degree, talking heads, but that's what I am on here now anyway. Um, so we'll continue this conversation, the British conversation, and I'll draw some uh, parallels, particularly with uh, continental Europe um, next week. And uh, I'll send everyone uh, an email telling you when the group details uh, have been released on um, Moodle. So I'm going to finalize that today. So it'll be either tonight or tomorrow morning. They will be available um, along with the stop the share. So the show. Um, along with this in considerable detail, you have that there. And most importantly, you will be able to connect through your group members to your new group members. I will um, set up a um, small forum for each of the groups that only the group members can participate in. So you can use that to interact. Um, then you can use other platforms if you want to subsequently. Okay. Um, I'll have a lot more to say uh, about that next Thursday. Um, so it would be very good for all the groups to make contact with each other um, prior to the class and uh, then we can interact. And I will also then schedule next week a drop-in session in lieu of yesterday so that group members can come and talk to me for further clarification. Okay, so get out and enjoy this stunning day and uh, look forward to talking with you next week. And thanks for your active participation in the breakout session earlier. Cheers, guys. I'll hang around for a bit if anyone's got any questions to ask. Right. Thank you.